Hello everyone, this is Experiment Designs in Computer Science, Week 3, Statistical Inference, Part 3, Interpretation and Validation. My name is Klaus and let's get started with this class. So, in the last, like in the last video we talked about how to execute a statistical test of null hypothesis in statistical inference and we thought that the result of the test could be reported as we have sufficient evidence to reject the new hypothesis at the significance level alpha, or we have insuffi insufficient evidence for rejecting the new hypothesis at the significance level alpha. Now, this is the correct way to report a test, but there is a lot of information that is not available here. There is We could give more information to make the report more useful, right? For example, okay, we rejected, but how strong did we reject? Is it a strong rejection? Is it a more or less reject? Is it a weak rejection? Okay. Also, the significance level is fixed. It's alpha. It's 95% or 99% or 90%. Why? Why is it 95? Why did you choose 95? Are you trying to hide something? Is your test maybe nine? If you, if you use 99% confidence, will your test fail? It's kind of related to the first question, but not exactly the same. Now, let's say that the new hypothesis was detected. How big? is the difference that was observed. Remember that we were talking about like, oh, I'm only interested in at least five grams or at least 10 grams. So what is this effect size that was observed? And uh, we talked about that the test could be sensitive. So if I said that I failed to reject the test, well, how, how sensitive was my test? What kind of effects could have passed under the radar. So all this information is some extra information that you might be interested when you look at the report from an experiment saying that the evidence was reject the new hypothesis was rejected by the evidence or not rejected. So one way to show some of this information is the p-value. And a lot of people might have heard of the word p-value before. P-value is super important, but also sometimes used in a way that is wrong. So let's try to clarify this a little bit here. So what is the p-value? The p-value, the, the, the definition of p-value is the p-value is the lowest significance level that if you use that significance level, the new hypothesis would be rejected. So it's the lowest possible confidence that you could use and the new hypothesis would be rejected for that test. Now, <clears throat> we can use the p-value to obtain more information about a statistical hypothesis test. So in a more general way, it's the probability under the new hypothesis that the test statistic that you are calculating would assume a value as extreme as the one that we observe in the sample. In other words, it's how surprising is the sample under the new hypothesis. A low p-value, sorry, a high p-value indicated that under the new hypothesis, this value that we observe, this data that we observe, it's not very surprising. Yeah, I mean, this is what I would expect under the new hypothesis, right? So, so it's normal. A low p-value means, oh, this value is surprising. This value is very surprising. It's not, I did not expect to obtain this experimental value under the new hypothesis. Maybe the new hypothesis should be rejected. Okay, so that's the general interpretation of the p-value. So how do we calculate it? Well, if we go back to the value, the, 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 to the, um, if we go back to the example from the previous video, the calculation of the p-value is basically the probability that the the new hypo, um, <clears throat> the, t the new hypothesis, sorry, the probability that the statistic would be less than the value observed when the new hypothesis is true. It's calculated as a integral of all the values from minus infinity until the value that was actually observed um, and of the of the, 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 the t distribution that we are using. It's multiplied by two because we're using a two-ended test. Okay. Uh, I recommend that you look uh, by yourself on, on the book on online what's the difference between the one-tail test and two-tail test and bring this question for me during the um, the office hours. Anyway, um, so to reject the new hypothesis in the experiment, we would need a significance of at least 0.14 or 86%. So with a significance of 86%, we would be able to reject uh, 
the new hypothesis. But if the significance was higher, we could not reject the new hypothesis anymore. And if you remember, we defined the significance as 95%, so we could not reject the new hypothesis because we would need the significance to be at least 86% to reject the new hypothesis. Okay, so the p-value calculates the smallest alpha that would be necessary to reject the new hypothesis. So we could think, one thing that we could think is, okay, but so why do we define the, the confidence first? If we know that the p-value gives us the confidence to reject the new hypothesis, why do we need to, call, to define the confidence before doing the test? Okay, we could look at the, the, the p-value. Okay, the p-value is 1.4. So I think that this experiment was surprising. I will define my, 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 F, my confidence as 85%, and now I can reject the new hypothesis. Yay! Well, that's a problem there. Well, the problem is it's still important to define the confidence before we calculate the, the p-value, because otherwise you are moving the goalposts. You cannot say what is a strong evidence before you look at the, the experiment, right? Or you could do something, oh, yeah, this is the value. Yeah, this is a strong evidence. You have to define what is a strong evidence. You have to define what is a good value for alpha before you look at the p-value, okay? Now, there is another problem with p-value, okay? P-value is very informative, but be careful. Um, it's possible because the p-value is a calculation, and all of you are computer scientists and you are computer scientists, and you know that if there is a formula, it's very easy to optimize that formula. So it's very easy to optimize the p-value, especially with computer science. One way to inflate the p-value to make the p-value become very very small is to increase the size of the sample size, increase n. Okay. So, for instance, let's suppose an experiment, and it really doesn't matter, where the new hypothesis is that the mean is 500, and the alternate hypothesis is that the mean is not 500. Let's say that the sample size is 5,000, and the average of the sample was 499. That was the average we observed in the sample. The error was 5. So that's the error of the sample. Now, if we calculate the p-value, okay, the t0 will be minus 14, and the p-value will be 1 times 10 to the minus 23. So the confidence of the, this test could be 99.9999999%. Wow! Wow, super small p-value. I reject the new hypothesis. I destroy the new hypothesis with facts and logic. Well, not so fast, okay? So the p-value is very small, but does it make sense? One thing that you need to note here, the average of the sample is 499. My new hypothesis is 500. The error of the sample is 5. So here, if we calculate the, if we calculate the, the, the confidence interval, the average of the sample and the mean will be very close and very in the middle of the interval. So, is this difference of 1 when the error is 5, is this difference important? Okay, so you need to always, not only, there are some people, you see in some papers, sometimes the people focus so much on the p-value, but they don't know that the real difference, the difference between the data and the new hypothesis is actually very small. So, it's a difference that from the test, the difference is significant, but it's not meaningful, okay? And there's a joke. He is my significant older, but our relationship is not meaningful. Same thing here. <clears throat> anyway, so especially in computer science, this is a big problem because a lot of the experiments in computer science is done by simulation, and it's relatively cheap to do a simulation over and over and over and over. So you can, you can reduce the p-value by repeating your simulation many more times than necessary. This is bad, okay? So that's why it's important to determine beforehand what is the confidence, beforehand what is the power, beforehand what is the sample size that I want to use. Because if you use that after you're starting doing the experiment, you can change these parameters to get whatever value you like, okay?
So how do we use the p-value responsibly? So to use the p-value, uh, to tell the whole story, to use the p-value in a responsible manner, it's important to use effect size estimators to test if our results are not only significant, but also meaningful, okay? Um, so there are books, there are, there's a reference down here of a essential guide to effect size that you can take a look. The general idea is very simple. Always report the size of the fact together with the p-value. For example, we can calculate the difference between the average and the, 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 the mean of the new hypothesis. Or there, you can even use this D estimator. The D estimator is the difference between the, 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 sample and the sample mean and the mean of the new hypothesis divided by the error. And if we use this D on the example in the previous page, we're going to see that the D is very small. So it's not a minimal dif meaningful difference. Okay. Another way to report this is when you report the p-value, also report the confidence interval. If you report the confidence p interval and the p-value together, it gives a better idea of what is really the difference size. Okay. Now let's talk about model validation. Another thing that is very important to use tests in a responsible manner. So today, in the first and the second video, we studied the new hypothesis statistical test. It adopts a number of assumptions. Some of these assumptions are statistical and some are technical. The technical assumptions we talked on the first video. Now, the statistical assumptions are like this. When you do the new hypothesis statistical test, we are assuming that the mean is a good measure for the question of interest. For example, this assumes that the variance is small enough. If the variance is too big, the mean doesn't really mean anything. Um, the weight of the packages is independent. If the weight of the packages, if the weight of the second package depends on the weight of the first. For instance, let's say that you are in a game and when you get the first one, the second one will be a little bit bigger. The third one will be a little bit bigger. The fourth one will be a little bit, bit bigger. If you have this relationship between the samples, the mean does not mean anything anymore. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to calculate the mean in that sense. Um, when we are using the mean, it means that anyone that is buying our chocolate buys always like many packages. If, they, if everyone only buys one package, it doesn't matter that the mean is 300. If this one person bought one package and that one package is like 250, 250 grams, that person will be very angry. It doesn't matter if I tell them, well, but on, on the mean, on average, my samples is around 300, 300 grams. In that case, my test would have to be different. Instead of making a test of the mean, I would have to make an experiment to guarantee the minimum value of my um, production. So that would be a completely different test. So these are some uh, assumptions. Another assumption that we make is that the sample that we took on the experiment is a representative sample. For example, if I have 10 factories and I take all of the samples from one factory, Maybe that factory is broken, but the others are not. Or maybe that factory is okay, but the others are not. So if I have 10 factories and I want to analyze everything, I have to take samples from the different factories. Or in another way, um, if, I do, if I know that there is going to be a test, I might want to, before doing the test, I clean my factory and I repair the factory and I get the best workers to work on the factory. And that would affect the value of my test. I want to do the test in the regular condition that I usually produce the chocolate. Okay. Or sometimes like the contents of the package are actually chocolate. Okay. So if there is, if I, if the weight is not only chocolate, but also the package, then the test of the mean might not be very good because the, the weight that changes would be just a small proportion. So these are all assumptions that you need to be careful about. Now, if we're talking about statistical assumptions, so those are our technical assumptions. The statistical assumptions are a little bit more fixed. Okay. These are a little bit easier to study for the case of the t-test and the z-test that we studied, we have the following assumptions. The sample distribution follows a normal curve. This is called the assumption of normality. The observations in the sample are independent. This is the assumption of independence. The variance is constant. So this is the, vari the assumptions of variance. So before you use this new hypothesis statistical testing, you need to make sure that these assumptions are maintained.
well, you can maybe do the, uh, the test before or the, you can check the assumptions before or you can take, check the assumptions later, but you need to make sure to test the assumptions or the result of your test will not be valid. So let's talk about some of these assumptions. Assumptions of normality. So the assumption of normality uh, is not that the observations are of one sample are normally distributed or even that the observations of the entire population are normally distribution. The idea is that the distribution of the sample means is normal. And as we saw last class, the distribution of the sample means will be normal in many cases if it follows the CLT, the central limit theorem. So to guarantee the assumption of normality is usually enough to make sure that the CLT is working for our experiment. So, if we cannot assume the conditions of the CLT a priori, if it's not possible to detect the assumptions of the CLT, we can do some tests on the sample to see if it's normally distribution. The simplest test is the QQ plot. The QQ plot is a plot where on one axis you plot uh, the, the observations of your sample and another axis you plot the theoretical value of the normal distribution. If your sample follows roughly a normal curve, then um, the, no, the QQ plot will show a roughly a linear relationship here. Okay? If it does not, then you start to have to, or to try a more precise test to see if there is deviations of normality. Or you can maybe try to see if there are, um, how do you say, <clears throat> extreme values that might have been caused by errors in the experiment. So that's also another way that's important to test. Let's say that you expect your sample to follow a normal, but when you do experiment, you see an outlier, a very big outlier. You can investigate that experiment and that can tell you something new that you didn't know before. Maybe it's because actually your, there was a broken equipment on your test, or maybe there's a special case that you did not think before. So it's important to test the assumptions of your test. Another way, without using visual, you can also do a test to check if your uh, data follows the normality assumption. Uh, we can use the Shapiro-Wilk test or the anderson darley test, Lilliford test. There are several tests. In this course, I usually recommend the Shapiro-Wilk test. Um, it has a lot of like... So these tests, they are statistical tests like the one we described before. The new hypothesis of this test is that the population is normal. The alternate hypothesis is that the population is not normal. Okay. In this case, if we reject the new hypothesis, it indicates that the sample that we obtained came from a normal, non-normal distribution. So we can check that again to see if there is anything that is happening, like a problem in the test or something about the experiment that we didn't knew before. Now, the independence assumption is actually a more important one. And one problem with the independence assumption is that we don't have a test for the independence assumption. The independence assumption depends very highly on how you do the test. Okay? The meaning of the independence assumption is that the values of the observations are not dependent on each other. So in your sample, you have 10 observations. The value of the second observation does not depend on the value of the first observation. That's the independence assumption. For example, let's say that you are measuring the speed of a robot. Okay? If you run the robot 10 times in a row, maybe the battery of the robot becomes low and the robot will start to become slow. That means that your experiment is not independent anymore. So how do you make the experiment independent? Well, in this case, before every experiment, we will recharge the battery of the robot to full. Another example, let's say that we are using an algorithm that predicts a time series curve. So we try the algorithm on 20 different curves that are our sample are 20 different curves and we're gonna measure all of them. However, five of those curves are actually different instances of the same model and the 15 other curves are completely different models. In this case, these five curves are related to each other and the results are related to each other. So our samples are not as independent, are not completely independent anymore. If the, if, the, if the algorithm is good on sample one, it will be good on sample two, it will be good on sample three. Okay? 
So in general, we want to guarantee that all the samples are independent through careful experiment design. There's a test that's a Durbin-Watson test that can be used to detect uh, some dependence. The problem with the Durbin-Watson test is that it depends on the order of the sample. So if the independence is not related with the order, then the Dubson-Watson test will not detect that. So it's not a very reliable test for this. The best way to guarantee independent is to be very careful when you think about your experiment. Okay, that's the end for this video. In the last video, I'm gonna summarize the topics of this lecture and I'm gonna answer some of the questions that were asked last week. See you there, thank you very much.